fourth and final approach we will be talking about is the Gordon approach. This was made by a man named Edwin Gordon. He was born in 1927. He went on to earn a bachelor's and master's degree in string bass performance from none other than Eastman School of Music. Um, he then went on to get a PhD from the University of Iowa in 1958. He spent many years teaching preschoolers music. He worked as the Carl E. Seashore Professor of Research in Music Education at Temple University in Philadelphia. After retiring from that position in 1997, he was a distinguished professor in residence at the University of South Carolina. He died in December of 2015. He is universally known as a teacher, researcher, editor, author, and lecturer in the field of music education. This theory came about um, from his research from the 1950s until he died. Um, it was made through his research in music aptitude and music achievement, which will bring us to our next slide. As you can see from this table, I have compared music aptitude and music achievement. Music aptitude is the potential for music achievement. And music at achievement is the realization of music aptitude. So there is a cross between the two. Um, you're supposedly born with music aptitude, something you have potential of. And then music achievement is sort of the landing point where you can evaluate how much music aptitude you used. And uh, music aptitude develops from zero to nine years of age. Music achievement, like I said earlier, is a landing place that you eventually make it to. It's a music learning theory that's based upon the concept of humans learning music through a nice little word called audiation. Audiation means you hear, think about, imagine a pitch or rhythm before you actually play it or sing it. Um, we learn communication and music in five ways through listening, speaking, thinking, reading, and writing. The learning sequence for students. Students learn through exposure, dependence, mindless imitation, and mindful connections. So during his research, he made a lot of parallels to the way humans are born, and when they're babies, they decide to learn. So the first thing you do when you're a baby, you hear your parents speaking, and you hear everyone around you speaking your native language. That's exposure. You're around it all the time. Next comes dependence. You depend on those that nurture you and take care of you. So I'm probably going to talk like my mom because my mom is the person who talked around me the most and nurtured me. Uh, then comes mindless imitation, uh, monkey see, monkey do, and then mindful connections happen much after. Um, you start to think about why you're imitating what you're imitating and what you're imitating does, and you make connections through knowledge. So they go about learning this in a few different ways. Um, he goes with a whole part whole approach. So first you start with experiencing the lesson holistically. Not learning it first, but experiencing it. Don't tell them anything about why you're doing it or how you're doing it. You just do it. Second is part. So you learn individual parts of the lesson. This is where you actually break it down, you teach it, and it's stomachable because it is just a single part of the whole. And then you come back and you learn the holistic idea of the lesson. So after you've experienced it, broken it down into chunks. Now you actually learn and digest the holistic idea of the lesson. So I have made a metaphor to pie. First, you see a pie, you smell a pie that's freshly baked, and you experience that pie. Second, you eat the different parts of the pie. You eat it piece by piece, digesting it slowly. And then it's all digested, and you get to think about how good that pie was, maybe what was in it, or how it was made. The learning sequence for teachers. So as I said before, whole half whole strategy. So they take things in that way and you teach things that way. You mirror the stages of human language learning. Like I said earlier, you nurture and guide each student through each stage. Uh, learning sequences are utilized. Skill learning, tonal, rhythm, pattern learning, um, and then solfege as well. So when you do these learning sequences, um, you introduce them to meter without telling them that it's meter. You introduce them to sound. You introduce them to different instruments without telling them. And then slowly, they understand. 
uh, sequential audiation development through learning sequences results in further and deeper enjoyment of students. Basically, that means that they're able to experience it and gain understanding themselves um, through the different sequences, then they enjoy it more. Um, in conclusion, Edwin E. Gordon grew up immersed in music and furthered his career in performance. He then moved on to further his studies in music education. He became an expert in music aptitude and music achievement, tying back to that little chart I made earlier. He then branched off and worked with others to study ways to develop and intertwine those two subjects. He studied the way humans learn language when we're born, when we say our first words, and when we end up going on and being our own individual adults. Um, he drew comparisons from our early stages of child development to early stages of musical development. Um, then he simplifies ways to integrate this concept into the classroom, the whole part whole and the different musical languages. Just to end this presentation out, um, this is a quote from Edwin Gordon himself. He said, without music, life would be bleak.